Hi, I'm Tom Myers of Anatomy Trains. We're sitting here in Phoenix with my good friends, Anne and Chris Fredericks. We've been friends for a very long time. Um, since they came to my structural integration training a long, long time ago, and I don't know if you ever applied it in the way that I taught it, but you took it away and applied it in different ways. So I'd love to hear from you how your journey evolved to stretch to win. All right. Um, I stayed in my room for a decade and developed the technique before I decided to step out and see what else was there because I didn't want anything to limit my possibilities. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be told what I couldn't do. So I stayed in my little cocoon and I worked on the technique and the philosophy of it. Who did you work on? Professional athletes. Okay. So that's from your beginning. Very, very where, beginning. It was Because you were a dancer athletes. before that. Yeah. I was a dancer, but I... You were both dancers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I seem to have a being the right place at the right time and getting an opportunity to work at Arizona State University in strength and conditioning. And I took the football team and tied them to the bench presses to get some leverage on them because I'm not very big and they are. Um, and then I was able to go, asked to go to the Olympics in 96 for the wrestling team. And from that point, the NFL found me and it just, they all know each other. Mm -hmm. And so I figured out how to lever and um, move them in a way that had never been done before. And I figured it out through trial and error and prayer, as you say, and all the, uh, um, all the things that worked and didn't work and applied to their performance on the field. And I just was in a kind of a laboratory. And then I thought, it's time to expand my horizon. Let's see what's out there. And we came across your stuff and I said, Let's go. This is where the next path is supposed to be. Uh -huh. So when you took that information back to your work with the athletes, can you give me some description of what happened? Well, you confirmed what I'd already figured out with the connection of um, the lines, mm -hmm. or which we call nets because of... It's fine. Yeah, the way we... I spell your name right still. <laughs> the, the way that the foot's connected to the top of the head and just that interconnectedness and that globalness mm -hmm. that is so um, evident when you look at a whole body mm -hmm. in movement. So it made perfect sense and it gave us a framework to put our work in, get it into more of a global approach as opposed to the traditional isolated approach that stretching had been um, for many, many moons. And okay, so, yeah, what, and, and you picked him up somewhere along the way. Oh, yeah, I, uh, I, I thought it would be nice to get a tall, you know, tall guy that had a, some helpful background. And I see. Chris, Chris uh, was introduced to me by an uh, orthopedic surgeon, and mm -hmm. I thought, physical therapist, well, you know what? I would really love to understand the philosophy of that. So how did you get from dancer to physical therapist? Injuries. <laughs> injuries. Injuries, yeah. yeah. Dance, dancer to physical. It's actually a very long story, but injuries. Yeah. And um, decided to go west, young man from New York City, came here, networking, surgeon, says, there's a lady, uh, th she's known as the stretch lady. Mm -hmm. And I play basketball with my friends on weekends, <laughs> and my hips are so mobile, I moved, like I hadn't moved in years since I've been young. You, I think she was a dancer, you were a dancer, you two need to meet. Yeah. Uh -huh. Little did he know, <laughs> his <laughs> words were prophetic, yeah. Yeah. and uh, we clicked right away, mm -hmm. and I gave a few in-services to her staff. Mm -hmm. She asked me out, uh, professionally speaking, for lunch to thank me. <laughs> uh, I would not take any payment, and from there, we decided to write a book. <laughs> she said that was the best line. I've never had anyone give me that line before. Oh, really? <laughs> People have used it on me. <laughs> <laughs> As it turned out, we started writing chapters on napkins in the restaurant, uh -huh. and uh, well, lo and behold, we've written a few books together. They're in their second editions yeah. and all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here we are. Mostly written in bed, as I... Ooh, yeah. Okay, I won't... <laughs> Well, it's that's my why, workstation. As right. newlyweds, that's why the first uh, book took two, uh, three, three years, years and <laughs> 10,000 hours of time. Virus intermissions. <laughs> and the second book took, took a year. <laughs> <laughs> Such is the nature of marriage. <laughs> okay. But, so I want to know how this fits in your mind into the science of stretch. What 
do you, what do you think you're doing mm. on the inside? Mm. Well, I think one of, the, one of the things that is so crucial is looking at the influence of the nervous system that you can dial it up or dial it down depending on what it is you're trying to get the body to do if you're trying to get it ready for activity or trying to downregulate it to recover. So that's kind of one of the places that we come into um, that crucial piece and the breath piece and how you can br bring it up or down with, with the breath increasing or decreasing from a tempo standpoint. Um, and then I think the other thing that always made sense was the connective tissue piece of it, which how one piece is directly affected somewhere completely differently in the body, like you were just talking about, and the logical um, concept of isolating to stretch never made sense to me. And the second I started looking at cadavers, it really didn't make sense to me, because you can't isolate anything. So trying to shift that paradigm from the traditional um, static, intense, painful, prolonged concept didn't make any sense to me. Okay, so what does make sense? What makes sense to me is not attacking the nervous system, but romancing the nervous system. Um, to truly listen to the tissue. You have to buy at dinner? Uh, and cocktails, yes. Oh, okay. And at least, at least uh, appetizer. Not a cheap date. It, a it, cheap it date. can be happy hour, but it's got to be a good one. <laughs> um, the importance of truly understanding what it is they need and not getting caught in the symptoms of how people show up and think it's here and think it's there and getting, um, looking more holistic at them. Um, I am a huge believer in doing way less than what they expect so their body can calibrate mm -hmm. without forcing it. One of the things I always say about um, the technique that we do with fascial stretching, the idea of being a modality that we work with the person synergistically and not on them or at them. So it's got more of that sort of dance of the connective tissue without um, having to speak. So that that ebb and flow mm -hmm. and the ease from the uh, practitioner and the person on the table experiencing it should be um, a very enjoyable thing and never a battle, never a struggle. So I think that kind of shifted the paradigm from how it was done traditionally, therapeutically in sports for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Chris, what do you think accounts, uh, she's giving a great account of how the practitioner relates into the work, but what do you think is happening mm. inside? Well, first of all, I hate the word stretch mm -hmm. because people uh, have their own idea what a stretch means. They always think it's um, an effort to, I mean, the word itself has several meanings, but the, the common meaning is to stretch something to, is to lengthen. Uh, the intent is to lengthen something. And I think in our work, uh, if you take uh, in mind the reference of the uh, tensegrity, mm -hmm. um, it's a stretch dependent, stretch um, activated system. So if you just look at that, uh, and the, so the system is under tension to begin with, if you take an athlete who wants to be stretched before a game, we don't stretch them uh, because that would weaken the system. And now they go in having to re-warm up and retense themselves if we're actually trying to lengthen things before. And studies have shown, and we all know this by now, most of us know this, static stretching is not the stretching to do before activity, but certainly the, before athletic activity. This is the Ray research, all the, that group that yeah. mm -hmm. essentially and said that you, by overstretching these fibers, are going to weaken the system before yep. you take, undertake an activity. So, yep. And there's tons of studies in strength and conditioning that show it decreases the power output, vertical jump, and sprinting, and all kinds of things that could probably lead to injury. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we do with an athlete, for instance, a football player who wants to have a stretch, we do a dynamic, we call it a dynamic stretch, but what I believe what we're really doing is giving them a sense that proprioceptively they've been stimulated and they feel ready to go because they feel their body. Mm -hmm. So we've reached a point of not truly trying to lengthen plasticity in a plasticity kind of way. We don't want plastic change right before game. Mm -hmm. We want elastic change. Mm -hmm. We want them to feel that elasticity. Mm -hmm. That's been activated. They get off the table in 15 minutes. 
and they feel ready to go within an hour of the game. And I think that's And you've what told them you've stretched them, but you haven't really stretched them. We use them. that one word because they don't understand proprioception. Yeah. You know, that we've enhanced your proprioceptive ability. Uh, the brain feels awake and alive. You feel more activated, dynamically loose. Mm -hmm. You're ready to go, but you're still stable. And, so, and, not, we, and not sleepy. Yeah. Not put into recovery. Not put into recovery mode. Mm -hmm. But because is, our company's called yeah. Stretch to Win, and we've mm -hmm. developed fascial stretch therapy, we call it a stretch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the word stretch needs, it's a spectrum from static to ballistic and everything in between. The, mm -hmm. And the everything in between has not been studied. So can you give me a sense of the range of mm. what's everything in between? A ballistic stretch would be a bouncy mm -hmm. stretch. And there is a time to do that, not necessarily trying to touch the toes over and over. No, but in a dancer order to who, stimulate the muscle, actually. Right, but a martial artist, a dancer, or a gymnast who swings and swings at higher and higher amplitudes after they've warmed up, is, it's a totally appropriate stretch. It, it definitely makes them ready. That is, actually, they're uh, eliciting the stretch reflex when they do that, so they can fire things a lot quicker and faster. Mm -hmm. So there's a time to do ballistic. Static stretching studies have shown, some studies have shown over the age of 60, static stretching might be more uh, appropriate for people over the age of 60 due to the, the maybe ratio changes. You would know better than that, perhaps with the collagen deposition. We're slow. <laughs> fibroblastic <laughs> deposition, whatever it is that accompanies aging. Mm -hmm. So it may need a longer duration mm -hmm. to get these tissues to change mm -hmm. in a plastic fashion. And then, um, you know, the, the parameters of intensity, that is how strongly felt is the stretch to the client or how, with how much force do you exert mm -hmm. is the intensity. Then duration is how long do we hold the stretch? tempo, how quickly, how slowly do we administer the stretch. All of these parameters, unfortunately, would be nice to know if we would have guidelines for every single activity that we do. Mm -hmm. But after I've done exhaustive, my own exhaustive studies, and maybe it could have been even more exhaustive, but I was exhausted <laughs> after looking at a lot of research. And really, there are no firm guidelines as to how to stretch females versus males, if there's a difference versus young, older, in adolescent, in growth spurt, mm -hmm. elderly, there are no firm guidelines out there in terms of high quality studies. There's actually more studies than ever before in stretch. That's what I found out. Unfortunately, what I also found out was there's a very tiny minority of high quality RCT, random control uh, Trial. trials, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and meta-analysis very small number of those. I don't know how it is for you. When I'm out on the road, people are always coming up to me saying, science must have done this. And the fact is, no. science, nobody's done it. Yeah. Nobody has gone in there and done that because that requires money that is only there if you're in professionals. If it's somehow relevant to professional sports, you'll get the money, but otherwise, or to rehab of something specific, but otherwise, yeah. stretch in general, yeah. physical education in general is getting very little money. What are, what? what do we need to do to stimulate this fascial system, this circulatory mm -hmm. system, this nervous system? It's very hard to actually get any research that means much. Mm -hmm. And the, the other thing is that people use research as a weapon. People have used that mm -hmm. Ray research to say, well, yoga is no good. No, strong yoga session is no good right before you go out for athletic performance. Sure. But that doesn't say it isn't good for two or three days before. And then you give your mm -hmm. body a chance to recover from that plastic stretching and it gets strong again. But um, where are you gonna find the studies that are gonna confirm or deny that? It's, it's really hard to do them. I think in our experience, there, if you wanna call it whatever you wanna call it, we'll call it stretch, but there is a movement that we do on a human being that has a stretch dependent or stretch activated system, which is commonly called in the fascial sciences tensegrity mm -hmm. or biotensegrity. Uh, as the basis of where the organism is to start at rest, it's under tension. And then, uh, so if we use that model, um, we will use our fascial stretch therapy to do a proprioceptive stimulation for a dynamic type of stretch, pre-game, pre-activity for the athlete. Mm -hmm. but, but then, of course, we will do an actual pur pur uh, purposeful um, stretch to lengthen, let's say, scar tissue or a an area that's definitely restricted in range and we want to lengthen that area, we might focus on one 
attachment mm. versus another attachment versus both attachments at the same time. So I think that's what we found wasn't in the literature or how to stretch. It was always you just stretch the hamstrings, you bend over, and it's only one direction or one direction. But it could be in two directions yeah. to get it, both attachments to open up. And then the spiral of it. Yeah, the stuff it in the middle. This is helped. what I like about um, Voitex. Were you in yeah. any of the dissections yeah. when Voitex was putting his needle in and yes. watching the different layers move? Mm -hmm. Is that it's quite a different stretch if you stretch the origin away from the insertion, the insertion away from the origin because of the gliding that has to go on and then inside. The, and the then side. if you add the spiraling to it, which is how we move in space, mm -hmm. right, with that spiraling pattern. Yep. And then speaking of the tensegrity. It's all twisted, yeah. yeah. I'll never forget when I first asked you, Tom, in your dissection class, I don't know what number it was that we took, we took several. Yeah. And I said, do you mind if we lay her, the cadaver on, it was the first uh, unembalmed. unembalmed. I said, do you mind if we try this, Tom? I said, excuse me, I, I, I just need to ask this question because it just hit me, uh, let's try this right now. So the psoas was exposed. We had you, we laid her on her side. I said, can you, you were already up there in her psoas. And I said, can you palpate the origin area, all those slips, L3 slip of the psoas. I want to hold her <laughs> leg so she's inside lying, bent bottom leg, top leg. I lined up the femur with her torso and I started to bend the knee. Mm. And I said, please let us know if you feel anything. And you said, when I flexed her knee, you did feel the, trans the force transmission mm -hmm. all the way up into the psoas at L3. Mm -hmm. And I was very careful not to pull her into hip extension. Mm -hmm. I made sure it wasn't from the hip extension. It was just knee flexion, because the hip extension is more obvious. Yeah, I was gonna pull. And I was like, mm -hmm. okay, there's some passive resistance in a cadaver. Mm -hmm. That's part of this tension network. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. of course, when we're alive, it's much more involved. Yep, so we're, we're always amazed uh, when we do the dissection at the adductor magnus muscle, which is bigger than all three hamstrings combined. And as you do the dissection, it's this great big loose muscle that pours out and you realize that when it's encased in its fascia, it's an amazing balancing muscle. It can go in all different kinds of directions. Mm -hmm. So only, you know, when there's no, nobody running it, its tone goes away and it's mm -hmm. this great big floppy thing in there. But um, if you're sitting there doing the dishes, your adductor magnus as well as your hamstrings is adjusting where you, your pelvis is while you, you know, scrub the pots and stuff. Mm. Um, so there's a controversy around about is the increase in flexibility or in the increase in range of motion due to the changes in the nervous system or the mm. changes in the fascial system. Do you have a place where you come down on that? I'd say both. Yeah, well, it's the easy answer though. But Whoa. <laughs> Um, Justify your I, answer. I would say the nervous it's system. Better. The nervous system drives it, and then the fascial system. Like you said, the fascial system's slower. Oh. Nervous system's quicker. Um, I think you tapped on the plastic. The plastic gains and the elastic gain difference. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of it's the motor patterns that you have to develop through. The, so my whole thing is flexibility only does you good if you've got the ability to have the strength to move it through space and the motor coordination to move it through space. So changes that last, you have to do homework to make it last and you have to have the balance of the strength and the stabilization in the joint so it stays beneficial and not just flexibility for the sake of flexibility. And I think one of the things that people, like you've talked about, people get stuck into movements that don't have much application to, to real life these extreme movements that um, create instability. Mm -hmm. So my whole thing is flexibility has to have strength, it has to have the motor control, it has to have the stability in order to be beneficial and, and I think um, that's the balance that we're trying to get in human beings for optimal well-being and preventative um, wearing of joints and things. Mm. From an aging standpoint. That's so hard to tell, isn't it? The wearing from aging it's because we very can't, hard. you can't study it. Well, it's, it, it's that, I think the feedback. <laughs> Do you have some of your athletes that you've been working on for 20 years that are gonna donate their bodies to science so we can see what they're doing? They're somewhere? probably more for their concussions, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. It, you know, yeah. I, I would think of one example where you have a client on the table and you know from experience they're holding, they don't have a straight leg raise at 30 degrees, 
when you bring that to their attention, mm -hmm. you don't say the word relax because that never works. Yeah. And you might fool the nervous system in trying different things and going to the other side and coming back. And when you finally get the person to realize they're actually holding, oh, there's, you're at 60. And that's where we might hit the feeling of connect of myofascia resistance, mm -hmm. not the nervous system mm -hmm. as much. Mm -hmm. But the straightforward fabric of the body resisting. The, yeah, mm. so right away you'll feel, and with experience, I would say, because I didn't feel this when I first started, I used to think, oh, they're tight at 30 degrees. Mm -hmm. Now I realize there's a lot, there's always a nervous system you have to work with. And so if they're symp in a sympathetically driven, we all are, of course, sympathetically, parasympathetically driven, but they're in that uh, stressful, anxious mode. Uh, so many people are just buzzing and reverberating, vibrating on the table. You bring them down, regulate the system. You see the nervous system was the first barrier of resistance, not the fascial restriction. You go up now to 60 degrees. Okay, maybe now we're doing some with some myofascial, but then you always are concerned about the sciatic nerve that might kick in at any point, but then you realize you can now go to 90 if you do some, let's say, PNF stretching, and now you have to be a little careful getting close to maybe stretching the sciatic nerve and so on. And I think that's one example within one person. You can see that nervous system influence, you see the myofascial resistance, then you're getting a little bit towards the anatomical end range of things, perhaps, with the nerve and other structures. Well, with the ligament, but I've seen mm -hmm. people come up against their ligaments, say, going into warrior poses in yoga, and after a few months, that, what I would say was the ligament, I don't have ultrasound on it, but you make progress, you make progress, you make progress as the rectus femoris gets longer, but then you reach this thing of where it's really um, very slow working, and my imagination of that is that people are then working on the ligament. Mm -hmm. but. Um, the model that I have of that is that there is very, very closely held collagen fibers in there and that slowly through the plastic deformation that the ligament is slowly breaking and making new... Sarcomeres? No, this is in within the, just within the tendon of the psoas, so yeah, making more sarcomeres would be in the muscle, but I'm just saying that the... So, the, well, that was the question that I was asking you, is it... Is it the fascia that's getting longer, or is it all sarcomeres? Is it all oh. uh, muscles, uh, you know, neuromuscular stuff letting go, or does the fascia get any longer? What does your foray into the research tell you? Mm, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's hard. It is it's a challenge to know, right? It really is a, a challenge to know, and I think there's the hydration factor as well. Huge. Mm -hmm. When you're moving, you know, people always have to get up when we unstrap one leg we're done with one leg they're like can i pee oh yeah the lymphatic <laughs> yes of course and we have this in, in all various body work. kinds of body work it's not relegated to just stretching but things are really moving in the lymph system with the movement of the stretching of the limbs and tension on tension off that pumping action maybe active a combination of active and passive it really gets things moving mm -hmm. and i think when we move fluids around that are static uh, stasis or it's just not Stagnant. moving mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's part of what's happening here the the rehydration the transition where you're moving the fluids now i think is a big factor thrown in with the the neuromuscular aspects of it and the fascial aspects of it mm -hmm. it's all three components it's interesting that and a little upsetting to the for the yoga folks that um, training is showing some of the same mm. range of motion gains that deep stretching is showing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the intuitive thing would be, oh, if you're hanging out and deep stretching on these things, it should be getting longer. But just training at the end range of motion. Mm -hmm. The tendon strengthening. Tendon strengthening yep. has more to do with actual... So is that... Is that accommodation? Is that? I think it's a combination I, yeah. because I think when you're doing tendon strengthening, I think you're building stability at the end range that they can move through space more safely. And that results in stretch tolerance. Yes, it does. Is, exactly. You're yeah. getting the creep effect, right? Because yeah. you're, you're continuing to push to the edges of it. I, I, can I give one example? You had a yoga master, mm -hmm. who used to, uh, my master teacher of other yoga teachers, of course, and she Mm. could get into any pose she wants to. She's a master yoga teacher. But she had issues she could not resolve with her own active mm. uh, training. So she came to see Anne, and Anne, Anne did things that she doesn't teach yeah. at her mastery level. 
And when, what I heard, I never witnessed this, but I heard them come out of the room and she's and it's like, I don't know what I just did to her, but, and she talked, and then the teacher talked to me, the yoga teacher and said, yeah, I could not do that in my training. And, and gets me to a place I can't even get to my yoga and then I can do even better yoga from her intervention. Maybe you can enlighten us what mm. went on in that room or <laughs> was it neuromuscular? Was it hydration? Was it <laughs> fascial? Mm. What was it? Yes. Um, I think it's finding ways to get into the corners that it goes back to the romance piece of not blamming into them and, and trying to push the edges, yeah. but working around the corners of it in a way that they feel safe and it can continue to open up and let go. So and in a way they can't do. Yeah. That's the thing. It's that out, well, from an assistant standpoint, it's that outside stretch. I don't think you can get outside. it all from training. You can get a lot from training. A lot of increased flexibility, mm -hmm. no question about it. Yeah. And maybe that's sufficient for that person or for lots of people. But other people want to achieve a higher level, like this master yoga teacher, mm -hmm you know, a gold medalist mm -hmm. that needs to get into these more extreme, you know, performance abilities with gymnasts, right? With their flexibility and strength and power mm -hmm. behind it. Mm -hmm. They need our assistance. Thank goodness uh, there's not a robot or machine yet that's going to replace us. No right? roto offer was <laughs> going to replace us. <laughs> so I, th I, think it's, I think it's a batch of things that come together to make it happen to make the changes happen. Uh -huh. And I don't think it can be one or the other, or I think like anything in the body, I think it's a combination of things that create the change. The thing that happens in my work, I'm not doing the same kind of thing where I'm trying to fix something before a game sure. or sure. Um, relieve a pain uh, is not my gig so much. But um, as I go through the sessions, I build up incremental change, and then all of a sudden, the system changes. Yeah. And that, I don't want to get too woo-woo about it, but it's almost spiritual. It, it just is something that changes within the whole set, the inner set of the person. When you get that, then it gets easy to make all kinds of well, and improvements. What happened with the yoga teacher was spiritual. That's where we were at. Yeah, and I don't mean to make it spiritual, spiritual, but it's well, but it's it, it's not just the Golgi tendon organs a, it's reset. It's a mind body. It's a mind body connection. Absolutely, that it, happens. It could be even an anthropological legacy of where tribal shamanistic traditions, mm. and all tribes have some sort of person uh, delegated uh, as the shaman, shaman, however you want to call that, healer, male, female, in different cultures. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much. I don't know anthropo anthropology that well, but it's. Pretty much is what I've looked at. All tribes have some person delegated um, to do that work, from and often from birth until they die and they pass on their knowledge to another person. And you feel that that's a major caretaker of that tribal community. And you can just they're tra you know they're they're brought up to just throw your body, soul, spirit at that person. I need help, and you trust them. I think by that session or whatever it was, mm -hmm. the person threw them through their body, spirit, soul at you. Do me. I trust you wholeheartedly in this process. And I think that's, that's something we don't talk about. And it's, it's part of our anthropological legacy. I really mm. believe that. I, I think so. I believe that. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> but I think there's some sound evidence with what has occurred with uh, tribal cultures, Margaret Mead and other people who have studied these cultures intimately, live with them. And uh, I, I don't think we should lose that. I think that's a, and even though we don't have these members of, and we don't live in tribes necessarily the way they did, certainly not within the natural, the natural elements, mm -hmm. we still need that. I think that's in our, I don't know if it's in our genes, but we need someone to trust outside of our family that we can still turn to. We're not going to turn to our family to do this for us, right? Oftentimes, most times. Well, our families of origin, everybody that you don't have to go back very many generations until 25 miles was the radius that most people mm. described in their lives. Mm. Wow. Right? You went well, over yeah. to the next valley maybe to find a wife or something, and you made two valleys away every two years to meet up and trade everything with everybody. But you mostly saw the same group of people every day and yeah. you didn't venture that far from your home. It's right. just these two, three, four generations that we have in back that... And to your point, many I'm sorry. people are traveling. Yeah. To your point, today you talked about people in your community, in your small village, mm -hmm. 
you could turn to to help you with whatever you needed, whether it's a new wheel on your cart or you needed them to not get rid of this knot in your neck. Mm -hmm. There was someone there and they didn't do it for money. It was barter, for we community. help each other, that's how we survive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's something about that that's, before that was in the tribal system with that sh sh shaman mm -hmm. that did that work. I think that healer person we need that, and it's it's not in the uh, uh, the certain land, in the American medical paradigm system. <laughs> going to the, with all due respect to doctors, that that's not they don't offer that part. Mm. No, and that, that I think it's unfair to doctors to ask them to right. put that part. Mm -hmm. Doctors now are getting so much more specialized. Mm. Somebody like this this is of a concern to me because I think that. Yoga teachers, stretch people, athletic people, body workers are on the front lines of healthcare now, and they're not Absolutely. being trained mm -hmm. to be on the front lines of, hair, of healthcare. So mm -hmm. you're standing up in front of the class, you're teaching people in yoga. You did a 300-hour yoga training or something, and who's they're asking you questions about their digestion, about their headaches, mm -hmm. about their it's a heavy medical pain, heavy medical issue, heavy medical issue, pain down their arm, and and people aren't qualified to do that. But they're not going to; these people are not going to go to their doctor about it either. Right. So we're kind of caught in this very interesting time in healthcare where doctors are not available for subclinical things, and those of us who are out there on the front lines are not really equipped to deal with these subclinical things, but are being asked to do it anyway. Yeah. I think there's an over demand and under supply. <laughs> so we better get cracking training some people. I've been cracking, you've been cracking? I've been cracking. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks very much, you guys. You betcha, our pleasure. It was our pleasure.